Hey everyone! Before the video starts, I want to mention that I'm now going to be live streaming challenges and random Pokemon content over on my Twitch account, and I've also made a second channel where I'm going to be uploading stream highlights. I'm going to be live about an hour after this video goes up, so if you're interested in seeing any of that, those two things will be the first links in the description. Okay, on to the video. What is going on guys, my name is John and welcome back to yet another video. Last year I released a video where I took on the Battle Frontier in Pokemon Emerald, and I documented my journey of collecting every gold medal that you can obtain in the game. Considering that you all seem to really like it, I figured now would be a great time to take on some of the other Battle Frontier areas. Today we're going to find out how easily you can get every gold print in Pokemon Platinum's Battle Frontier. So just like Generation 3, the Battle Frontier is one of the main attractions to the post-game, but rather than having an area to be its own section of the map, this location is tied in with a new island that you can visit once you defeat the Elite Four. While the implementation of this area is quite a bit different than the previous generation, the goal is still the same. Obtain every gold emblem from each of the facilities. Before we get into the challenge, be sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe for more content like this. And with that out of the way, let's just jump right into it. When you first arrive at the entrance of the Battle Frontier, the attendants will upgrade your versus recorder that you received in the main story, and then apply the Battle Frontier Pass to the device. With this, we can see all of our accumulated battle points, as well as a list of our medals or prints that we've collected. Now, if you've played through Emerald's Battle Frontier, you'll notice that this new area is a little... small in comparison. The island in Gen 3 was built to basically look like an enormous theme park, while this one is arguably smaller than the town that you start the game in. I'm pretty sure this was done just because there's a lot of wasted space in the original area, but aside from that, a majority of the features from the previous version have returned to Sinnoh. So just like last time, we're going to need some sort of team to get through this challenge, so let's go over the team that I put together. Unlike last time, I spent a long time trying to find a team that's not only good, but accessible to anyone that has a copy of Pokemon Platinum. When I went for all the medals in Emerald, I had Pokemon that were option-based, which means that if you didn't have a person to trade with, my team would be pretty difficult to make. Fortunately, this team is not only extremely strong and balanced, but all these Pokemon are relatively easy to collect. It's important to remember the standard restrictions set in place for the Battle Frontier, as we're not allowed to use a majority of legendaries and mythicals, and each Pokemon in our party has to be holding a different item. I also want to note that in most of the battle-related challenges that I do, I build my teams around the sets from Smogon. Although you could probably win with any team that you put together, building the team around the OU and Uber meta game ensures that you're making the best sets for each facility. Just like last time, we're only going to use three different Pokemon for all the areas. But if you spend a little time researching, you'll find that there are a ton of different Pokemon that would perform very well at the Battle Frontier. The first Pokemon on our team is going to be Salamence. In a competitive format, this Pokemon is a no-brainer, as its base stats are very strong, and it has a wide move pool to cover a bunch of different opponents. First moveset, I decided to run with Dragon Dance, Outrage, Earthquake, and Flamethrower. Out of this whole team, this is probably the hardest Pokemon to build, and that's mostly because Dragon Dance and Outrage require you to do some egg move breeding and move tutoring, but it's well worth it where you can see just how strong it can really be. I decided to give it a Life Orb to boost all of its attacks, and I decided to invest my EVs in attack and speed to really increase my advantage. I also want to note that if you're following along, I highly suggest EV training to the best of your ability. I know it's a lot more tedious than the 5 minutes it takes to do in Sword and Shield, but if you at least max out your stat medicines, you'll still see a significant improvement over not tracking your EVs at all. The next Pokemon on our team is Lucario. This Pokemon can be used for both types of attacking, but I chose to run this with a special set. The moves I chose for this one are Aura Sphere, Shadow Ball, Dragon Pulse, and Vacuum Wave. While a couple of these seem pretty obvious, it may seem a little redundant to have a dragon move when we already have a dragon Pokemon, but there are definitely a decent amount of situations where this can come in handy. Vacuum Wave is a fantastic priority move, and when you combine that with Choice Specs, the power of this move increases dramatically with the addition of Stab. The final Pokemon on our team is going to be Togekiss. If you know anything about Togekiss, you know this Pokemon has potential to be extremely busted if you play your cards right. The moveset that we're going to go for is Air Slash, Thunder Wave, Roost, and Substitute. This is intended to function as a defensive staller, but with Serene Grace you can still deal a ton of damage over multiple turns. Because Serene Grace doubles the chance of a move's additional effects, Air Slash has a 60% chance to flinch the target. If the opponent is paralyzed, you can add another 10% to that, which means that there's a good chance that you can knock your opponent out without them leaving a single scratch. When you combine it with the healing powers of Roost, Leftovers, and defensive EVs, this is an extremely hard Pokemon to take down. Now that we have our team put together, let's begin our Frontier Challenge. 
Unlike Generation 3, we only have 5 facilities rather than 7 to take on. But in my opinion, I think that these ones are a lot more interesting than areas like the Battle Pyramid and the Battle Palace. The first location we're going to take on is by far the most well known. The Battle Tower. The Battle Tower has been around in almost every game in some shape or form, and if you've seen any of my videos from last year, there's a good chance that you know all there is to know about this place. This facility consists of 3 vs 3 single battles, and the objective is to win enough battles in a row to challenge the Frontier Brain. Upon defeating them the first time, we're awarded the Silver Print, and on the second match we're given the Gold Print. This applies to every facility, but the requirements vary depending on which location you challenge. It's important to note that you can actually do double battles in this building, but you're unable to get the Silver and Gold medals, so if you're trying to do this yourself, make sure to only play in the singles format. For each time you register to compete, you're required to battle 7 trainers in a row, and the difficulty increases steadily as you continue your streak. The first few battles will start with relatively weak Pokemon, but as you advance to double digits, the teams become quite a bit stronger, as well as have multiple movesets and items, which makes it much more difficult to predict their strategy if you have to make multiple attempts. With the team I chose, you can breeze through the first few sets before you actually have to think strategically, and a lot of the time Salamence will one-shot the opponent with Outrage, making a lot of the initial battles only take a few turns. Upon reaching the 21st battle, we had to face Tower Tycoon Palmer. Up until this point, you've probably not battled a team like this, so this is definitely great insight as to how the rest of the facility is going to go. His team consists of Milotic, Rhyperior, and Dragonite, and coincidentally his team plays very similar to how I created my own. He decided to leave with Rhyperior, which was arguably the best case scenario because Salamence has Earthquake. Because Lucario is choice, it would have been more difficult to switch out, so either way I was able to take care of that pretty quickly. He then brought in Dragonite, which got one shot with Outrage, and with a Vacuum Wave I was able to finish off Milonic for a very easy win. After this point, you're going to have to spend a lot more time thinking about the moves that you make, but I was genuinely surprised at how well this team works together. In all the other battle tower runs I've done before, this was by far the smoothest streak I've ever attempted. There were definitely quite a few close calls, but a majority of the battles were a clean sweep because of how strong and fast Salamence is. Once you've cleared through 48 battles, you're required to have a second match with Palmer, and this battle is no joke. Rather than having a match with a slightly stronger team, he decides to bring a full team of legendaries. His team consists of Cresselia, Heatran, and Regigigas, and all of them have type coverage for basically anything that you throw at them. From my experience, he usually leads with Cresselia, and this is by far the most difficult Pokemon to get around. Because it's naturally bulky, it's very tough to take down when it also has Moonlight and Leftovers, so if you have a counter, you should bring it in as soon as possible. I once again led with Salamence, and I ended up getting a Crit Outrage turn 1. Although I didn't knock it out because I was quad weak to Ice Beam, I definitely would have had a good chance of losing if I didn't get its health that low. I knew the Lucario without speed, so I went for Aura Sphere, which let me bring Heatran down to its Sash before sending out Regigigas. Although it seems like Togekiss would lose because it knows Stone Edge, I was able to paraflinch it so badly that it couldn't attack from the moment that I used my first Air Slash. After the battle, the attendant applies the Gold Battle Tower print to our Frontier Pass. Let's check out the next one. The next facility that we're going to take on is the Battle Hall. This is a brand new area included in the Battle Frontier, and it's probably the most unique one out of the new set included in Generation 4. The format in the Battle Hall is once again a knockout style match, but rather than using a team Pokemon, you're only allowed to use one. Upon registering for the challenge, you can pick one Pokemon, and you have to use that same Pokemon throughout the entirety of your journey all the way up to collecting the gold print. If you attempted to continue the streak with another Pokemon, the game will end your old streak and start you from the beginning with a new Pokemon. Upon entering the arena, you're shown a table with every type available in the game, and from here you can choose what type of Pokemon you'd like to face for the round. Each typing has a rank next to it, which increases in number for each time that you battle that specific type. On your first battle, you might have noticed that the Pokemon you face are much lower level than you. As you progress through the ranks, the Pokemon will not only increase in level, but also much stronger Pokemon will appear in the rotation. Another important thing to note is that unlike the other facilities, the Battle Hall requires that you fight 10 trainers per streak rather than 7, but that isn't really a big deal considering that you only have to take on one Pokemon per matchup. Another very important thing to consider is that when you pick the typing of the Pokemon you want to match up with, this can either be their primary or their secondary typing. This means that you can still pick a flying type and have battles with Pokemon like Charizard, Zapdos, or even Dodrio. Still don't understand how this can fly. For this area, I chose to use Salamence for a few reasons. Aside from being extremely strong with solid type coverage, the main appeal that it has is the fact that it has the ability Intimidate. 
This gives me an immediate advantage, turn 0, for a lot of battles. But in turn, Salamence has a 4 times weakness to ice, which means that pretty much any ice beam is an instant failure. Although a lot of people might think that the best play would be to battle every rank 1 first, and then move on to the next rank for each type, it just makes the ending streaks absurdly difficult. After a few failed attempts, I decided to take my worst type matchups first. By getting rid of the Ice, Dragon, and Rock ranks, I had a much better chance to make it through the rest of the facility. That being said, wow were the Ice ranks difficult. The first 6 or so ranks were perfectly fine, but if I didn't knock out the opponent in the first hit, I immediately lose to whatever Ice move they have on them unless they use something like Ice Punch. I'm pretty sure I failed this first section about 6 times to things like Cloyster, Dugong, Walrein, and Lapras by just being absolute tanks. But considering that it only takes about 5 minutes to get to that point, it's really hard to get frustrated. Oddly enough, the dragon ranks are really easy, because you can outspeed just about everything. But aside from that, the rest is pretty straightforward. Once you reach the 50th battle, you have to take on Hall Matron Argenta. Because they knew you probably picked this battle to be something that you have an advantage over, the Pokemon she selects is completely random from the Group 3 section of the Battle Hall. There's a list of over 200 Pokemon, so the odds of you getting what you want is probably not very good. Fortunately, her choice was Agron, who immediately lost to a single Earthquake. The gold symbol requires you to complete every typing, which means you have to do all 170 battles in order to get the final print. Like I mentioned before, the remaining section isn't difficult, and a majority of it I was just mashing the A button while I was watching livestreams. I wanted this one to be a little more difficult, but because their levels are almost always below you, it really doesn't pose a challenge for like 98% of your matchups. Upon reaching the final matchup with Argenta, she decided to use Dust Noir. I hit it with an outrage and left it with almost no health left. Oh god, she has access to so many moves. Ice Beam, Blizzard, Rock Slide, Destiny Bond. <sighs> there is no way I'm going to w Oh. <laughs> what an idiot! The next location we're going to take on is another familiar face. The Battle Factory. This is by far the most popular one out of the bunch, and that's probably because of how quickly your team can go from seeming unstoppable, only for your Latios to get one shot by an Ambipom in the next match. When you're talking to the attendant at the entrance to the factory, you're able to choose between the level 50 or the open level for this competition. If you watch the Emerald version of this, you know that one option is significantly better than the other. If you choose level 50, the Pokemon that you're given are picked from group 2, which almost entirely consists of stage 2 Pokemon. Generally the movesets for these Pokemon are pretty bad and don't make any sense, while the open level consists of all fully evolved Pokemon, as well as legendaries that you can pick up as you make your way through your streak. If you really want to torture yourself, you can try the level 50, but personally this one is already hard enough. For each time that you continue your streak, you're given the choice of 6 random Pokemon, and you can pick 3 of them to use for the next 7 battles. For the most part, the Pokemon that you pick will range from, wow that's busted, to what idiot would pick a victory bell. After each match you complete, you're given the option of trading one of your Pokemon with one of the Pokemon from the previous trainer, so you essentially have to build your team as you go. In addition, before each match, the attendant will give you hints about the trainer you're about to face, but the information will become less and less helpful as you progress through the streak. I will say it's a lot more generous than Emerald, because they'll initially tell you exactly what they have, but after about 30 battles, they'll basically tell you nothing about your opponent. As you'd expect, there really isn't an amazing strategy that you can use for this, and you basically have to hope that you get Pokemon that are somewhat useful, but it's expected that this will take more attempts than any other facility to get through. After multiple failed attempts, I reached the 21st battle with Factory Head Thornton. Just like the rest of the trainers, his team is completely random, so let's just see what the attendant has for us. Oh, that can't be good. Yeah, so when you face the Frontier Brain, the game randomly selects whether his team comes from Group 3 or Group 4. Group 3, as I previously mentioned, consists of fully evolved Pokemon and a few legendaries. Group 4, on the other hand, consists of only legendaries. Because of this, his team consists of Moltres, Articuno, and Cresselia, which is horrifying when you didn't get a single legendary the entire time until this battle. I'm extremely grateful that I had a Dragonite on my team, because my other Pokemon dealt no damage to Cresselia, and considering that it was extremely likely to have Moonlight, I would have had to start all over. Thankfully after landing a few Dragon Rushes, I was able to collect the Silver Print. The road to the 49th battle was not nearly as hard as Emerald, but there were definitely multiple moments where I was scared I was going to lose. On the 40th battle, I managed to collect the Dream Team, Raikou, Entei, and Latios. By far the best team I'll probably ever assemble in this facility. My opponent decided to send out a Shuckle with the moves Toxic, Substitute, Double Team, and Sandstorm with Leftovers. Because I let it get off one Double Team, I missed every move until it reached Max Evasion. 
The only Pokemon that I had left was Entei, and I kid you not, I spent 20 minutes battling this one Pokemon. I had to max calm mind, and I spent the entire time yelling at my DS to land just one hit. For some reason, it didn't use Sandstorm after the first time it subsided, so I managed to eventually win only because of that reason. I know it seems kind of strange to highlight this one random battle, but that's only because the final battle with Thornton was over in 5 turns. His entire team was weak to electric moves, so Raikou and Entei swept up his entire team without a problem. Alright, what's next? The Battle Castle is next on our list, and this is another new addition to the Battle Frontier. The game mode has the same outlines as the Battle Tower. 3v3 matches with 49 total battles to receive the gold print. The catch to this facility is the introduction of castle points. After each match, you're given castle points based on specific tasks you've completed in the battle. These can range from things like finishing in a certain amount of moves, to winning without losing a Pokemon. This currency can be used before the next battle for a few different things. The main use is that you can use these points to heal your Pokemon, which means yes, the damage that you take from the previous battles carries over. Because you're not allowed to use items here, you can also spend your points to give your team items, as well increase your team's levels, or scout out your opponent for a much greater advantage. Initially, you only have access to a few options, but by using your points to upgrade your rank, you can complete new features to counter the stronger teams that you face. For every 7 battles that you complete, your castle points carry over, which means you can amass quite a lot as you make your way up, but once you lose, all of your points will disappear as well. From my experience, after the first bunch of matches, you'll be earning more points that you can spend, which definitely helps out later on with the more expensive unlocks that you can purchase. Once you reach the 21st match, you get to battle Lady Caitlyn. And yes, this is the same Caitlyn from Black and White. But because she'd much rather lose in the next generation, you're forced to battle her butler, Darak. Unlike any of the other locations, both the gold and silver battles have two sets of Pokemon, but the only difference between them are the movesets the Pokemon will have. His silver team consists of Staraptor, Empoleon, and Houndoom. And despite looking like a pretty easy team, he has a couple of tricks that make it a lot more difficult. I brought Houndoom down to its focus sash with Outrage, but it ended up using Counter, which killed off my best chance of winning. Thankfully Togekiss came in clutch to stall out Staraptor for the rest of the match, but I'll admit that I got extremely lucky with this matchup. After completing this battle, Duroc will mention that you can now use your castle points to pass trainers. Now considering that you can use your points to see your opponent's team, I figured that it meant you could replace a trainer with another one if you didn't have the right type matchups. Instead, this option lets you straight up skip the entire match and axe if you won the battle. Although it cost 50 points to use it, I ended up earning about 600 points by the 30th battle, so I literally spent all of my points to skip the final battles in the facility. I think this is a pretty big oversight, because I earned way too many from the initial battles, so I had to put zero effort in what was supposed to be the hardest section of the area. As you'd expect, you're not allowed to skip the final match with Duroc, but aside from that, any other battles are totally fine to pass. In the 49th match, he brings an Entei, Empoleon, and Gallade. Because Salamence counters two of these very well, I had a strong chance from the start of having the advantage. After a quick 2 minute battle, I was able to collect the gold print for the battle castle. Now let's check out the final location. The battle arcade is our final stop for this challenge, and just like the previous facility, this is another standard format, but with a small twist to test your reflexes. When you begin your streak, you're brought into the stadium with your opponent, and then both teams are displayed on the screen. The announcer will then start up a roulette board with a bunch of different options on the screen. On your bottom screen there will be a button, and the objective is to stop the marker on something that will positively affect the battle. These events can range from little things like give you or your opponent a berry, to burning and paralyzing your whole team. Each event is colored, which indicates which side of the field it will affect, but there are additional grey boxes that increase the speed of the roulette, add weather conditions, or even swap your team with your opponent. For the most part, the button is responsive, so if you click on the thing you want, you'll land within a space of what you wanted. But if you mess up, that can completely change the outcome of the battle. It's really important to pay attention to your opponent's Pokemon, as if you land on a status that can't be applied to one of your opponent's Pokemon, the game will just ignore it. Examples of this are getting poison on steel types, or paralyzing a ground type. In a lot of cases, you'll find that a lot of the good events will be close to each other, so even if you miss what you wanted, you'll still end up getting something in your favor. There are a lot of times where you'll land on one that doesn't change the battle at all, which personally I find kinda weird because it doesn't make the game any different than the battle tower, but if you don't want to risk getting something bad, it's a safe option. Once you reach the 21st battle, you'll get to take on arcade star Dahlia. Her team will consist of Dust Noir, Medicham, and Ludicolo. 
Because she decided to leave with Ludicolo, I knew that there wasn't really anything that she could do to damage me. So I set up with Dragon Dance, and I was able to one-shot her entire team without a problem. It was definitely the best case scenario, because this team is actually pretty tough to beat. But her final team is much more difficult. Her team this time around is Zapdos, Blaziken, and Togekiss, which doesn't take a genius to realize how threatening this is. I will say I'm pretty confident at this point though, so there's no way I can ma Oh no. Yeah, so I ended up freezing my Pokemon in the final battle of the entire challenge, and I was 100% sure that this match was over from the start. But she decided to leave with Blaziken. Out of all the moves it could use, she decided to use Flare Blitz, which immediately thawed me out, and I was able to damage all three of her Pokemon with Outrage. After tanking a Thunderbolt from her Zapdos, I was able to finish it off with an Air Slash to defeat the facility. Somehow. And with that, we've successfully obtained every gold print in Pokemon Platinum's Battle Frontier. But how did I do? So let's review. Overall, this Battle Frontier was easier than the last one, but this was definitely a pretty tough challenge. Just like last time, I came into this pretty well prepared, but I was shocked at how well this team worked together. I can't really think of any Pokemon that would suit this team better, so if you're interested in trying this out yourself, I'd highly recommend giving this team a shot. If you end up trying this yourself, tweet it out and tag me in the post at JohnstoneYT. Other than that, that's all there is to say about getting every gold print in Platinum's Battle Frontier. And that's going to do for today's video. If you liked the video, leave a like and consider subscribing, as we'll be uploading more content like this very soon. If you have any other suggestions for videos that you'd like to see, leave a comment below. Follow me on Twitter to keep updated with new videos as they come out. Also, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, if you want to check out my live streams as well as sub to my new highlights channel, those will be linked in the description below. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.